I just have to say, wow, I, I'm just so humbled. I am, I'm, I'm humbled to be here. I'm humbled to be able to stand there and listen, listen to Passion Band sing about our King. I'm humbled that Louie and Shelly, Brad and Brittany would, would have me back. And, and most importantly, I just, I'm humbled to be a part of Passion the last two days and sit there and see what God is doing. In, in your life and in mine. I'm humbled to be able to hear Christine Kane talk about being in the presence of God and then humbled to be able to hear Jackie Hill Perry talk about encouraging one another and then humbled to be able to just watch Catherine share her life story and can't help but weep almost the whole time and then to hear JP talk about being on offense, not defense for Jesus and then to hear him so clearly share the good news of the gospel and then last night to, to be able to hear Louie talk about why we were created. And that we're designed to reflect our creator. And then he challenged us. Would you say, yes, Lord? And thousands of you stood up and so did I, because I wanted to say, Less, yes, Lord. And then Louis shared the definition of, of passion for Passion Church and Passion Conference. The degree of difficulty you are willing to endure to accomplish the goal, the mission, the task. And I'm just so humbled to be here to, to see what God is doing and what God is doing in my heart. And I would humbly this morning challenge me first and foremost and, and maybe all of us to say what will be the greatest passion of our life? What will be the greatest passion of our life? Will our greatest passion at the end of our life, will it be for the cause of Christ? Will it be? I think there's two things. There's a lot, but I think there's, there's really two things that, that cause us to not truly pursue our passion for the cause of Christ. And number one is passion for the world. And, and I'll be honest and want to admit that I think in my life, my greatest passion so far in my life hasn't been for Jesus. I would say it's honestly probably been for sports. And why do I say that? Because let's actually look at what it really means in Louis' definition. But then also let's go back to what the word even means. You see, passion is a 12th century Latin word that actually means to suffer. Where does it come from? Because they saw this guy, Jesus of Nazareth, that cared so much for people that he was willing to go to a cross and die on Calvary because he cared so much for you and me. So they said, what do we call it? We'll call it passion, the passion of the Christ. That's what it means. So understand when you say, hey, I'm passionate about something, know what you're talking about. It means you care so much for something, you're willing to suffer for it. And so far in my life, I have been more willing to suffer for a game than I ever have for Jesus. Why do I say that? Because I've given up more in my life to win a game than I ever have for Jesus. It doesn't mean that I'm not passionate about Jesus. I am passionate about Jesus. I love Jesus. I've just been more passionate about a game. Why can I say that? Well, I, I've played so many games with a broken leg, broken hand, broken sternum, broken collarbone, broken ribs. 
I've gotten up more times in my life to train in the middle of the night, early in the morning, late at night, so that I could win a game. I've spent more time watching film, studying, preparing for a defense than I ever have studying scripture. I was fortunate to be playing for the New England Patriots and well, Coach, Coach Bell, okay, calm down, right? We're in church, this isn't a place for the Patriots. <laughs> I'm kidding. Social media, don't put that out. So, so Coach Belichick calls me and he says, hey, Timmy, we're, we're so excited to have you. We're so excited to have you. We're grateful you're part of the team. But Timmy, I, I want you to know, we have our quarterback. I was like, what are you, what are you talking about? Obviously, he's talking about Tom Brady, guys. <laughs> and he says, hey, I just, want you, I just want you to do your best. I just want you to do your best at going under the radar being one of the guys. And I said, yes, sir, I'll do my best. So we're going through practices and we finish a practice and the next day we have an off day and I get a call from one of my agents. And he says, Timmy, I got an unbelievable opportunity for you. And I was like, awesome, what, what is it? He said, hey, tomorrow on your off day, there's a company that's, that's filming a commercial and they only need you for a couple of hours. Just to show up for a couple of hours, it's super easy. And for you going and being a part of it, just for a couple of hours, they're gonna pay you a million dollars. And I was like, dang, like, what's wrong with them, why? <laughs> and I was like, that's, that's awesome. He's like, okay, cool, can I tell them you're, you're a yes? And I said, uh, hang on, I, I, I told Coach Belichick, I told him I would do my best at going under the radar. L let me call and ask him first. And he said, no, 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 no. Do not call him. If anything, apologize afterwards, but do not ask for permission. You should also know that he works on commission, so he wanted me to say yes. <laughs> and I said, no, I, I think it's the right thing to do. So I hung up with him and I called Coach Belichick and I explained the situation. And he listened to me, and then he said, hey, Timmy, I appreciate you calling. I really do, and I would also appreciate if you didn't do it. And I'm like, I would appreciate if you change your mind, you know? <laughs> I'm just kidding, I didn't say that to Coach Belichick. Now, let's be honest, you wouldn't either, okay? And I said, yes, sir. And I hung up and I, called my agent back and I said, sorry, but you gotta call him back and tell him that I gotta turn it down. He's like, what, why would you do that? Because I was passionate about a game. Because I was passionate about making the team. And if it just gave me that much more of a chance to make the team, then I would turn it down. And Probably should have said yes, because I got cut like three weeks later. <laughs> oh, that's funny? That's cool. Let's laugh at your worst days. But why did I do it? Because I was passionate about a game. But the question you should ask me is, Timmy, if someone called you right now and said, hey, you have a chance to lead one person to the Lord, to help one hurting person, but you give up a million dollars right now, what do you say? What would I say? Man, I hope I would say, of course. What would I say? So that's why I would say in my life, I've, I've been more passionate, because when you look at the definition, what are you willing to suffer? The degree you're willing to endure to accomplish the goal, man, I endured a lot passionate so much to try to be the best I could at a game, to win. It's not that I wasn't passionate about sports. It's just have I ever given up as much. So for you, my, my, my challenge is, what are you most passionate about? And it doesn't mean those things are wrong. Being passionate about sports isn't wrong. Being passionate about school isn't wrong. Being passionate about your job, your occupation, I would say it's a good thing. But is it more than Jesus? Is it more than the call on your life? Is it more than hurting people? 
or is it in its proper place? And I think the second thing that is the challenge to living with passion for the cause of Christ is apathy, because sometimes we just don't care. We live an apathetic life, because it's hard to live with passion. Obviously, I just told you, you gotta suffer for it. And so sometimes, like, dang, I just don't care. What does apathy even mean? Lack of interest, concern, or enthusiasm. Some of us, we're just apathetic. You know, in, in Acts 17, Paul is waiting for Timothy and Silas to show up in Athens so they can go on their mission trips. And, and while he's waiting, he's debating Stoic philosophers. And in their mindset, one of their things was apatheia. And, and they would say that's their, their mindset. And they called it the good life. And part of living the good life was to live without passion. Because then you don't have to suffer. Then you don't have to suffer. So I think two of the reasons why we don't live with passion for the cause of Christ is, well, because we're more passionate about other things. And secondly, because man, sometimes it can hurt, it can suck, it's not easy, and so I'm just gonna choose apathy. And so today, humbly, I wanna challenge myself, first and foremost, but also all of us, in three areas that maybe we could choose this year to truly live with passion. And, and the first one that I would choose would be to run. Not to walk, not to jog, not to stride, but to run. 10 times, Paul tells us to run. And he's not talking about like physically, like dude, I'm, I'm doing sprints. No, he's talking about running after the call that God has on your life. I love how the, the message paraphrases 1 Corinthians 9, 26, 27. I don't know about you, but I'm running hard for the finish line. I'm not giving it. I'm giving it everything I've got. No lazy living for me. I'm staying alert in top condition. I'm not going to get caught napping, telling everyone else all about it and then missing out myself. Hebrews 12, 1. Therefore, since we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, we must get rid of every weight and sin that so easily entangles us and run the race that is set before us. Or are we willing to passionately run? To truly be passionate about the race that is set before us. See, also when, when I say run, and I believe when Paul talks about running, it implies a sense of urgency. Do we live with a sense of urgency? You, you heard Louis talk about it last night. If we have eight seconds for some of us, four seconds is gone. And you might think, oh, I'm just in college, I got a lot of time. You don't know. You have no idea. A couple years ago, I was I was dating Demi at the time, and I was so in love with her, and I so knew that, that I wanted to propose to her, and I, I wanted her to, to be my wife one day, and I was flying to New York City where she lived at the time, and I couldn't wait to see Demi, except the problem was I had shows all day, and I'm going to New York City where she is, and it's like, okay, I gotta figure out something special, and except, let's be honest, I didn't plan ahead, so I had nothing special, and I finished that whole day of, of shows, and I, I meet her at, her favorite restaurant, and I was like, oh crap, like I'm terrible, I have nothing for her, I have nothing special, and so the whole time we're eating, I'm texting my agent under the table, and I was like, hey, any chance that you could get me tickets to see Hamilton? And I've already, I had already seen it multiple times, I knew she would love it, and I was just like, please, come on, come through for me, and he's like, what? He's like okay, what, what do you mean, a couple months or something, your tickets or so, and I was like, no, no like 20 minutes. He's like, dude, that's impossible. I'm like, please, you know. And so we finally get to the, uh, to the end of dinner, and he texts me back, and he's like, I got him. And I was like, yes. And I was like, so babe, you know, I just, I love you so much, and I've been planning this for a while. <laughs> and I've got us tickets to go see Hamilton. And she's like, wow, this is awesome, blah, blah, blah. And so 
We walk a couple blocks over and we, we, we go and we're, we're watching the story about Alexander Hamilton and I love this play and it's a fascinating play and it's a, the, the story of Alexander Hamilton, one of our founding fathers and I'd already seen it multiple times. I got the soundtrack on my phone. I listen to it all the time. I love it. But even though I've seen it a bunch of times, listened to it a bunch of times, it was fascinating that God chose this time to do something in my heart and in my head, and we're sitting there, and it gets about halfway through the play, and we have these amazing seats, like literally like Alexander could like spit on us if he wants, we're so close, and <laughs> gets to the middle of the play, and they start singing about Alexander Hamilton and about, about his life. And they start singing a song called Nonstop. I'd heard it many times. But you see, they, they preface it by saying that, that Alexander Hamilton, John Jay, and James Madison come together to have this, this plan to write the Federalist Papers to defend the U.S. Constitution, which is a very noble cause. How cool is that? Like, we're literally going to write papers to defend the U.S. Constitution. Like, that's really cool. And so they, they, they get together and they say, oh, we're going to write 25 of them. John Jay wrote five. James Madison wrote 20 something, Alexander Hamilton wrote 51. I believe for maybe 85 essays they wrote. And so they start singing this song about Alexander Hamilton, about he cares so much about the call that he has on his life, about what he believes in, about defending the US Constitution, that they say about his life, how about Alexander Hamilton, how do you write like you're running out of time? Write day and night like you're running out of time. Every day you fight like you're running out of time, like you're running out of time, like you're running out of time. How do you write like tomorrow won't arrive? How do you write like you need it to survive? How do you write every second you're alive, every second you're alive? And I was just sitting there and I couldn't help but start to weep and Demi's like, what's wrong with you? Like, this isn't even like the emotional part. Like, you gotta wait till like one of them dies, you know? Like, she didn't know what was going on, but it was God pricking my heart. And you see, that's the words they were singing, but it's not the words I was hearing. See, what I was hearing is God pricked my heart and saying, do you really live, Timmy, like you're running out of time? Do you fight for others like they're running out of time? Do you share with the lost like they're running out of time? Do you cling to me like you need me to survive? Every second you're alive. I was just so impacted that night that one day if anybody would ever sing about me in my life, would they ever say that I had anywhere near the urgency for what God has called me to as Alexander Hamilton. Listen guys, Alexander Hamilton had a very noble cause. But for us believers, it pales in comparison to our call, to our mission, to our mandate, to the Great Commission. Listen, that is amazing to defend the US Constitution, but we get to be part of the greatest rescue mission in the history of the world because what Jesus did on the cross and he has commanded us to take it to the world. But have we, and by the way, do we have any urgency? Why do we need to run? Because we're not living on our timeline. We're living on theirs. And every minute that I chill, that I hang, that I don't go, that I don't share, how many people do I miss not getting to? Am I living on my timeline, which maybe I think, oh, I'm in college, I have 10, 20, 30, 50 years. But how many people did I not get to because that's, I'm apathetic. I don't really care. Or I was just more passionate about doing something else. What else is gonna be more important? What timeline are we really living on? Are we really passionate about running to hurting people, to lost people, to people that need you? 
I've probably run harder to score a touchdown than I have to the lost. And I hope at the end of my life, I can't say that to you. I hope I can say maybe I started that way, but I didn't end that way. The second challenge I would give is it's going to get hard. So will we endure? Will we endure? 1 Corinthians 13, 7 says, love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. The word endures comes from a Greek word that's a compound word, and it's a hupomeno, which actually means under and remain. We would say remain under. And another visual a lot of scholars would believe is if there was an army that was approaching you and even your own soldiers started to retreat, would we put our foot in the ground and have our shield ready even when it gets really hard so that we could endure, we could hoop a minnow, we could remain under even when it's a lot of tension, even when it gets really hard. You know what's fascinating about that word, about how we're called to love and live passionately? As Paul just tells us there in 1 Corinthians 13, 7, it's also the same word that's described to use him going to the cross. In Hebrews 12, 2, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, for the joy set before him, he endured, he hoopaminoed, he remained under. Despise the shame. Endured the cross. And he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Will we run? Will we endure? And then third and lastly, will we remember? Will we remember? You see, when, when we leave here, you know what's gonna happen? We're gonna go get on planes, trains, and automobiles. We're gonna go home. We're gonna hang out. For a little bit, we're gonna say, oh my gosh, that was unbelievable. What happened at Passion was so freaking cool. And then it's gonna slowly start to dim and fade. And and we have to remember, it's also why 22 times in Deuteronomy, Moses reminds the Israelites to remember or do not forget. And it's like, man, I first heard that, I was like, what? Why would he even have to say it twice? It's crazy, like, could you imagine if all of us got to be freed, and then God parted a massive body of water, and we walked through it, and God rescued us. And then all of a sudden, time starts going by, and we're having kids, and they're growing up, and we're like, hey, we just gotta tell you, this is what happened, this is what happened to your dad, this is what happened to your mom. Like, this is the story. You would, I feel like you would never have to tell me, remember. They forgot what God had done. They forgot how faithful he was. And by the way, so do we. So do I. And so that's why I wanna challenge us to remember. And what does it mean to remember? To look back at the cross and to meditate on it. To bring it to mind, that literally is what meditation is. To bring it to mind to chew on it. To bring it to mind to chew on it. To bring it to mind to chew on it. Over and over and over again. To remember what he's done. And that's also what Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians 5, 14 to 15, for the love of Christ controls and compels us. For the love of Christ controls and compels us because we have concluded this, that one died for all, therefore all died, and he died for all, so that all who live would no longer live for themselves, but for him who died and was raised for their sakes. Paul is compelled by the love of Christ It controls him, it compels him, it's what fuels him, it's why he's so passionate, it's for the love of Christ. And so he looks back at the cross because it demonstrates the love. That's why we have to look back at the cross and remember how loved we are. That Christ demonstrated that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. We have to go back and remember. You know, as as an athlete, There was a couple years where, man, I was just getting crushed so much in the media, like 
dude, he sucks. And a few people say, no, he's not that bad. And they're like, yeah, he sucks. And they're like, oh, he's not that bad. But like, yeah, he sucks. And you hear it, and you hear it, and you hear it. And it would just be so frustrating. And then you know what would creep in? A little bit of doubt. Like, man, I know I'm, I'm, I'm still good. No, I can do it. I'm still good. And you know, it got to the point where I was encouraged by someone, go back and watch your highlight video to remember how good you are. Remember how good you are. And I go back a couple of times and watch a highlight video. Remember, I can do this. You know what? Why do we need to keep going back to the word of God and to the cross? Because we have to remember how good he is. When we face the hard times, when we face the frustration, when we face the disappointments, we gotta remember the cross. We gotta remember how good he is. I gotta remember in my life, I wasn't even supposed to be born. I was a miracle baby that God spared. I gotta go back to the cross and remember everything that God has done in my life. The greatest rescue mission of all time was for you. It, w- it was for me. How easily we forget. John even says the last verse of his gospel. And there are also many things Jesus did, which if everyone was written down, I suppose not even the world itself could contain the books that would be written. Listen, God's highlight video is so vast, the world couldn't contain it. That's what Jackie was talking about. Do we ever? Encourage one another. Hey, you remember God's highlight video? It's so freaking cool. You remember what he did for you? You remember what he did for you? Because life's gonna get hard. The degree of difficulty we're willing to endure when we remind ourselves, when we look at the cross and remind each other what Jesus has done. Oh man, that cross. Like Paul, man, that, that compels me. It controls me. It's why I'm gonna run. It's why I'm gonna endure. And I know I'm gonna mess up. I know at times I'm gonna slow down. I know at times maybe I'll I'll even quit, but maybe I'll look back at the cross and be reminded and be compelled and then controlled again by the love of Christ because what else matters? What else matters? In the early 400s, there was a monk in Asia that was called to go to Rome and He had no idea why, he was unsure, but he knew God called him to Rome. His name was Telemachus, and and he goes to Rome, and he's unsure of why he's there, but then one day all these people are gathering at the Colosseum, and so he goes into the Colosseum, and there's 80,000 people, and he sees all these gladiators fighting in this amphitheater. And he's blown away and he's stunned and he's seeing literally them killing each other and then one of them loses and everybody either puts a thumb up or thumb down to say yes, he lives or kill him. And he's blown away like what, what is happening? It was less than 400 years ago that Jesus was dying for us and now this is the value of human life? What are we doing? And one of them would lose and And then there would be a man that would come out with a mallet and then smash his head. So he he was either alive, now he's dead, or he was dead, he was really dead. And so they would drag the body off and he's thinking, oh my gosh, what what is happening? What are we doing? And he was so compelled by the love of Christ for humanity that he had to do something. And so he ran down the steps and he climbed over the wall and he ran into the middle of the amphitheater And he stood in front of the gladiators and he said, in the name of Christ, stop. In the name of Christ, stop. And the crowd started to chant, run him through, run him through, run him through, until one of the gladiators stabbed him. And then 80,000 people started throwing rocks at Telemachus. And he's laying on the middle of the amphitheater floor bleeding out, taking his last breaths. And one more time, he said, in the name of Christ, stop. And then he took his last breath. And after a couple of minutes, they stopped.
stop chanting, to stop throwing. And then they began to be compelled. What was it about this guy? And one by one, they made their way out of the amphitheater. And word got back to the emperor about Telemachus, his courage, his conviction, what compelled him to do what he did. And three days later, the emperor stopped these brutal games. And there's never been another one since because of Telemachus, because of his passion, because of the degree of difficulty he was willing to endure for Jesus, for humanity, for you, for me. He didn't know those gladiators. He didn't know the people, but he knew they're worth it. How, how does he know they're worth it? How does he know you're worth it? How do I know you're worth it? Because Jesus was willing to go to a cross and die on your behalf, on my behalf, and offer us a free gift of eternal life that we can't work for, that we don't deserve, but he offers us. You see, when I understand that about my life, and, and sometimes it almost feels too good to be true, too surreal, because I'm not worthy of it. I've messed up so many times, and I'm like, God, why would you love me so much? I don't get it. I'm not that lovable. God, why? Because that's who our God is. And, and then see what happens is that compels me because he loves me, and he loves me so much, regardless of what I've done. And you see what happens is when I start to see through that lens of, of how much God loves me and then I look at you and even though I don't know you, I think, dang, God loves you that much too. That also means I need to love you. You're so valuable to God. He was willing to give his son on the cross for you. Have I ever treated people as such? Why do we run? Because if we really believe the gospel is true and we really believe that people have never said yes to it or never heard it, then how selfish am I to never tell them? I never tell you about the greatest exchange in the history of the world, the greatest trade in the history of the world. How could I? Man. At the end of my life, what do you think's gonna matter? A championship, a trophy, an award? the people that God died for that maybe will never know about what he did for them because I wasn't willing to tell them. For too long, I've missed the mark. I don't wanna spend the rest of my life missing the mark and so I wanna challenge all of us that when we show up here on January 3rd of 2024, that we could all say, yeah, we weren't perfect this year, we messed up and probably won't be a year where we're ever perfect. Let's just be honest about that. But man, this year we decided that there's not gonna be one thing that we go after with more passion, with more sacrifice, with more endurance, with more speed, than for the cause of Christ. That yeah, maybe we still can be passionate about other things. But I don't wanna be more passionate about a game or anything else. Because there's only a few things that last forever and all of them are for the cause of Christ. God, people, his word and rewards. There's only a few things that are gonna last forever and are we passionate about those things?
things. I would challenge you, but first I would challenge me with this. Why don't we do it? Is it because we, we don't believe the gospel to be true? Or we don't view people as worthy to hear it? Why? What is the reason? Do I not believe it? Or do I not love you enough to tell you? I hope at the end of my life that, that even though I've probably made that mistake many times of for, forgetting the goodness of God, forgetting what he's done, and probably many times putting myself first. But man, could you imagine the impact? If 20,000 people and however many are watching around the world right now, we said, hey, the degree of difficulty we're willing to endure to accomplish the goal for the cause of Christ is gonna be first, it is gonna be foremost. We are gonna run, we are gonna endure, and we are gonna remember the cross and what God has done in our life, and we're not gonna stop. We might slow down for a second. We might mess up for a second. We might forget for a second, but we're gonna remind each other, hey, take a deep breath, because we're freaking going again. We're gonna go again because it's worth it. What he did for us is worth it. You are worth it. And ultimately, at the end of my life, what else is worth it? Let's make sure this year we're passionate about the cause of Christ because we know it's the only thing that's worth it. Passion, we love you guys.